we are permitted to enter your house and worship in your temple. Lead us all, O Lord, in righteousness, even as you prepare the way before us for our spiritual well-being through the forgiveness of sins. Control our worship this morning so that we grow in grace and truth to honor and praise you for your indescribable gift, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 27. Thank you. 
Okay, the court will follow your page 12 and we'll read your supplement. Please rise. We begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. I trust in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
Uh, the text we'll look at this morning comes once again from Mark's Gospel account, chapter 7. Uh, we reread verses 21 to 23, which say, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within the vile men. So far, our text. Friends in Christ. If we look at the larger context, of what's going on here, we'll see that it was a matter of faith that Jesus was addressing in our text here this morning. His disciples were eating bread, and the Pharisees inevitably caught up to them. Mark 7, verse 2 tells us that when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with the file, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. That's not out of line for the Pharisees who were constantly trying to find fault with Jesus or to find fault with his disciples so that they could pin the fault on Jesus. The Pharisees found fault because of their many man-made laws. They had to wash their hands in a certain way. When they came up from the marketplace, they could not eat unless they had washed their hands, and not just their hands, but even their cups, their pitchers, their copper vessels, because even their pouches needed to be washed in a certain way according to their laws. Jesus' disciples evidently didn't wash themselves according to that Pharisaical law, and that's when the Pharisees saw them eating bread. Jesus would take this opportunity not only to tell the Pharisees that they were wrong, but also to take the time to explain to them and to the crowd why they were wrong. He would teach them that the unclean needs cleaning, but the uncleanliness that he was talking about was not the same kind that they were talking about. His lessons started off with the word from the prophet Isaiah. He called the Pharisees hypocrites and quoted him saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines, commandments of men. Teaching the commandments of men and claiming that they were of God was a specialty of the Pharisees at the time of Christ. They had around 600 and 13 laws that they held as true, the many were countered by Jesus time and time again. And that's not to say that some of those original laws were bad. Many of those laws were found in the Torah. In fact, most of them were. Instead, many were contextual with the Old Covenant. Their importance was not that the people could uphold these laws, but rather that the Christ and so relying totally on these old covenant laws, their hearts ended up being far from God. And that's always the case with somebody who goes beyond what God has said. They openly taught that they themselves were right and that they were the true followers of God. If we think back on our Old Testament reading here this morning, God's word in Deuteronomy 4, 2 says, You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor shall you take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And that's important for us to remember because there's a long tradition, unfortunately, even within Christianity, that more is sometimes better. Maybe if we contribute more, we can have a better chance at salvation. But were the Pharisees keeping God's commandments by their unnecessary additions? Are we keeping God's word any better by any unnecessary additions? No. Their washing traditions brought them no closer to God than the disciples who were sitting there eating bread with their unclean hands. Now, one might sound better than the other. We have the opportunity to wash our hands before a meal. I'm sure most of us would probably want to. 
do that instead. Apparently, everyone would take cleanliness over uncleanliness, right? And especially in this society, we seem to value hygiene and physical cleanliness. There's a market for just about every hygienic thing imaginable. Or I think back a couple of years ago when coronavirus made its way stateside, there were places that couldn't keep antibacterial soap or hand sanitizer stocked on their shelves. Why? Because cleanliness is a good thing. They say, stay clean. Keep yourself away from all that. And, of course, cleanliness is good. But that's not what's being talked about here. That's not what's being disputed. There was an uncleanliness about that day, but it was not at the hands of the disciples. It was an uncleanliness that came from the Pharisees' hearts, and indeed, everyone's heart. In their hearts, the man-made laws of the elders and ancestors took precedence over God. They were so focused on the physical that they disregarded the spiritual. What matter did it make if their hands were clean, if their cups, if their pitchers, the copper vessels in their houses were clean, if their very hearts were defiled? Jesus said to the crowd, so that they could hear the lesson, hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. These are the things that defile a man. And there is, of course, an original sin that dwells in our sin from birth. We inherited it. And so even with our best efforts, all we could ever end up producing is sin. But those other sins that we commit, those are definitely on us too. And Jesus presents quite the list, one which covers everything. He doesn't leave any room for somebody to say, well, I'm the victim here. No. Many times people will say that they were tempted to lie, to cheat, to steal, rape, murder, or any number of other things. They say that they need money. The opportunity presented itself, so they stole it. Or they saw something and just had to have it. They saw a man or a woman in revealing clothing. That person was just asking for it. But that's not how this works. This evilness comes from within. Where does it fall by? Where does it come from? comes from within, not those outside sources. Even we might be tempted to say that we're not guilty of one thing or another, and yet that would be prideful on our behalf, foolish to say in opposition to God, blasphemy for those very same reasons. The uncleanliness, the defilement comes from within. It is the fault solely of the sinner. That's a message that's not going to bode well with a lot of people. In fact, it's not going to bode well for most people. And yet it is a most important message of God's law. We have to remember God's law is not a bad thing because it is perfect. It is holy. And the reason his law is such a terrifying thing for sinners is because our default state is sinful. Traditions that mankind has passed down is nothing good, perfect, or holy. We have only passed down sin. It is rebellion against God. That was all that our ancestors had to offer. That's all that we would have to offer if we were left to our own devices. Because all of humanity was dead in its trespass and sin. Our hearts might have had a beat, but Amounted to nothing. There was no life behind it. Apart from our perfect God, there would be no light, no life. There would be no cleanliness. And make no mistake.
mistake. The unclean needs cleaning. The Pharisees were not going to clean their own hearts by the laws that they can, uh, concocted for themselves and others. His disciples weren't going to clean their own hearts just by tagging along and being there, just like we're not going to clean our own hearts simply by coming to church. No, there's something else going on. We cannot clean our own hearts by any inventive schemes that we might come up with from within. The heart of every person was defiled and dead and could only be cleaned and brought back to life by one person. That is Christ Jesus. Jesus would show them that day and he would show us through his word that there is only one way that people can be made clean, only one way in which they can have life, only through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. We remember also when we think about that tagging along that not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of the Father. And when we ask the question, you know, who does the will of the Father? What can we do to be saved? We remember those poignant words that Paul spoke to the Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Now, does that sound too good to be true? Well, we live in a cynical world, and most things that we hear often aren't too good to be true. But we're not talking about something of the world here. We're not talk talking about something that came from the heart of men. We're talking about the world of God. This is completely true. A clean heart does not require a long list of things that you must do. It involves putting everything on Jesus through faith. The word that tells us of them, our hearts find cleanliness. In the waters of baptism connected with that word, we find the forgiveness of sins in the body and blood, in, with, and under that bread and wine we will be taking here shortly. We find the promise of forgiveness once again. He presents it to us all the time. Every place that his word is taught in its truth and in its purity. And to earn this forgiveness was far more complicated than using the ceremonial tubs to wash your hands and feet as the Pharisees did, or to sprinkle water on that furniture to wash it. No, to clean and resuscitate our sinful hearts. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was faced with temptation from Satan and mankind alike, and yet he himself had no evil thoughts committed no evil deeds, kept God's law and purity and truth, and not as others had come to interpret it. <clears throat> he did all this with a clean heart so that he could clean ours. He presented himself as a sacrifice on Calvary's altar and was put to death in our place. The clean heart and innocent death washed away our sins. Though our sins were like scarlet, now they are as white as snow. In his death and resurrection, Jesus also assured us that our hearts have been properly cleaned. We are accepted by God for his sake. That cleanliness is more than enough. <coughs> the unclean needed cleaning. Our Savior took it upon himself to carry out that task. And now the job is done. Now we await his inevitable return, telling others where such cleanliness is found. We put on that whole armor of God by faith and fight those temptations that are ever before us. In a few moments, we will pray of God to create in us a clean heart to do the right spirit within us. So may we pray with that with all certainty and sincerity, knowing that he alone can grant it and that he has. In his name we pray. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. <coughs>
God, Lord of hosts, we thank you for the gift of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, for the perfect way that he made your love and will love and will know to mankind, for his holy example of true humanity, and for his innocent suffering and death in our place, through which we have received everlasting life. And since your word is a lamp to our feet, your gospel is a pure light for our path. Oh, Father, we thank and praise you for the gift of the Holy Spirit and your word, through which we gain understanding, patience, comfort, and hope, both now and for eternity. Grant that we may always live in the Spirit, so that, led and empowered by him, we may renounce sin and wickedness in our lives, and instead follow righteousness, godliness, faith, and love, and finally, in your everlasting kingdom, receive the inheritance that you have promised us through your Son. Uphold in our land all that are in positions of authority, so that in the maintenance of law and order, we may lead a quiet and peaceful life and serve you freely. Bless our homes and instruct our parents, so that your pure word will not depart from us, but instead be continued in the lives of the children. Guide our youth, so that they may learn to love their Savior and live his word, and in faith and purity live happy and productive lives. We pray for all who must walk along the road, the hard and stony path of affliction with sickness, suffering, or peril. Let their way be filled with light that shines more and more brightly until a perfect day. These and all hidden yearnings of our souls, along with any other needs that you see for our well-being, grant unto us because of the merits of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray these things, and who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I'll sing our next hymn number 310.
lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is great and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Wherefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Thank you. 